in terms of artifacts approachability, um, monetization was a problem. <gasps> Destruction makers. This is part two. This is lane two in the artifacts video. Yeah, we're going mid. We're going to talk about the uh, artifacts approachability in this video in terms of uh, monetization, but also beyond that in terms of its gameplay approachability and its viewership ap approachability. Yeah. Uh, with it being designed pretty explicitly of being a, the goal of being an eSport, uh, its approachability is uh, in terms of audience approachability is probably very important. You want viewers to be able to understand what's what's going on on right. screen. Yeah. Yeah, and and from understanding that you then would want to play the game potentially. The one analogy that um I've heard brought up about this is like basketball. Um mm. you can watch people in the NBA play basketball, but you uh, can also just do a pickup game at a court, right? Like there's no Right. There there, there there's very little uh a barrier to entry in terms right. of playing basketball other than have a basketball and a hoop. Okay, so um, monetization is something that gets brought up a lot in terms of why Artifact failed. Uh, I do think it's a factor, but I think it's not as big of a factor as what uh, it has sort of been made out to be. Right. I will say that when you're in a an environment in which all of your competitors are free to play, it's pretty bold for you to come out and say this game costs twenty dollars plus more microtransactions. And in all fairness. They got headlines for it. Yeah, uh, I don't think they were all positive. Not positive, <laughs> yeah. but they did. Uh, they did get a lot of press because of it. Um, so uh, I think I can steal man Richard Garfield's argument a little bit here in terms of I think he probably was the one who was saying, "Hey, this is a game that people should pay for." Um, in that, uh, there there's an interview where he talks about how his opinion is that games should cost money. That um, a free to play model. Uh, pushes game design in directions that it shouldn't necessarily go uh, because you have to uh, gather uh, uh, money through different through through sort of other means, right? right? You have to force players to grind essentially. In which case, at that point, the game is more focused on player engagement as opposed to the actual uh, strategy. Uh, strategy, yeah. yeah. And and um, this is something that he's even talking about with Magic the Gathering in that. Uh, when a game's focus becomes shifted on sort of it being a collectible, it's sort of collectability, it takes the focus off of the game design itself. And I yeah. think that's one of the things that he feels, uh, you know, I'm putting words in his mouth, but uh, from interviews I have seen of him talk about this, it's something that it, it's sort of like, I, I don't know if regret is the right word, but it's definitely one of the things that he does not like about modern magic design, or at least has been, it's one of the things that he has spoken out against in modern magic design. Right. We've talked about it that, I mean, if a game is good and it attracts the right audience, people yeah. are hyped about it, people spend money on it. Right. right? Yeah. Um, it is a barrier to entry mm -hmm. that maybe was not necessary, but does it get you to, uh, to, to be able to keep the focus on the actual game design rather than move into this collectability land? Right. Uh, okay. So, so in terms of artifacts approachability, um, monetization was a problem. When you look at the design, so so I think making the comparison between Artifact Classic and Artifact Foundry, so Classic being Richard Garfield's intention, like we, we're not okay, we're not a hundred, <laughs> we're not a hundred percent sure if this is the case or not. Yeah, but you can being able to experience both of these styles of artifact is it's, it's very pretty, interesting. It's very interesting, and I think it's pretty telling in terms of like okay, well, the classic is when Richard Garfield was working with Valve on it, and Foundry is when he was not there anymore. It it is hard to tell though how much of Foundry is just a reaction to player feedback, right. as opposed to a counteraction of design principles, right? And yeah, for sure. And I think that's more likely what's what's the case yeah. in that. Um, you know, maybe Valve was just trying to satisfy the audience that remains and try to, you know, pick up the pieces, I guess. So when we look at, I think one of the, the biggest design differences between the two games is that in Classic, you view one board of the three at, at a time. And when you look at Foundry, you see all three boards at once. Right. And that, at the, that, sort of overwhelms you especially as a new player you're, you, you i don't think seeing all three of these boards at once is even something that's necessary as a new player and this is information chunking that we see richard garfield do in in uh, also in magic if we look at artifact classic and you view one board at a time 
the other boards matter, but not when you're a new player. Right. Magic also does a very good job of this as well in that there's a whole lot of interaction points in Paper Magic that you are just completely unaware of right. as a new player. Like and they most don't players matter. only think there's three phases, basically. Right, yeah. and like those things don't matter when you're first learning the game. And I think Artifact falls m- more in that line, or Artifact Classic, does a better job of chunking that complexity down to, hey, you just need to focus on this board right now. Don't worry about the other boards yet. And you'll build up the knowledge to be able to chunk the information and move on to thinking about things more in the macro than in the micro where when you look at artifact foundry you're seeing all three at once and it's telling you hey all three of these things are equally important at any given time and that's not true right it's it's not true but it it is true that you should be looking at all boards which is why i see the justification for it in foundry right and they chunked the complexity in foundry by limiting i think you can only have five things on your board in foundry so they at least made it so you can't have an infinite board like you can in classic um however yes going back and forth between because that's what we were doing this last week is playing classic playing foundry going back and forth talking about it and yeah foundry you immediately notice like okay there's way more to think about right um not only with having to immediately deploy heroes um because that's also something you do in foundry uh which is right off the bat you're having this strategy that you have to input information into which feels good for the player that feels good for the player to feel like they have this interaction right but it's a lot to consider and it's overwhelming for a new player it it feel to me is like i felt a massive difference in playing these two versions of the game yeah where i i I had originally played classic before foundry was even a thing and i would i remember you know having some fond memories of playing it but thinking okay you know it's it's not going to get me to stop playing my other card games or whatever this isn't going to end up being my card game of choice but now when i fired it up and was like all right i'm gonna try foundry out what's what's the difference here and i and i and i start playing it and i see the three and immediately i'm just like there is so many decisions that I have to make before I even sort of like get to make any impactful decisions. I get, or, or just like all of the decisions decisions are impactful at that point. It feels like I have to consider everything at once when I don't actually need to do that as a new player. Well, right? and actually the, there is a systemic difference between classic and foundry, which is that in classic you, you can, you want to zoom out and you want to look at the full board in classic um, and so I think that's where they got the justification for Foundry of like, okay, well, you're going to look at the full board anyway, so we might as well zoom out and focus in on it. But the difference is that in Classic, you can only play things to the board that is designated at the time or the lane. And so you can only play things on the leftmost lane when until both players pass and then you move to the middle lane. But in Foundry, you can play on any lane at any point in time until you pass and it moves to the shop phase. Uh, when you're coming to Artifact from a different card game, there are sort of these pre-established archetypes that you could uh, that you could bring with you in terms of things like, hmm. uh, are you playing an aggressive strategy? Right. Are you playing a controlling strategy? Are you playing a combo deck? These things are sort of ubiquitous among card games, and I think a lot of it has to do with them having somewhat similar structures. Well, an Artifact um, subverts basically all of these in yeah. that it's it's not easy for a player to come in and say oh i want to play an aggro deck i'm going to build an aggro deck and know what that means in the artifact system yeah uh and i think that i think that that was an attempt to uh keep the game and sort of like more unsolvable but in a environment in which there are like the internet exists right yeah. and games enter a solved state much faster than they once did because there's just so much data for you to mine um making it so that players don't have that that initial footing and they need to develop new heuristics for strategy and deck building yeah. i think gives the game mu- a much longer growth period i actually think it's what drew more people into the game i think it caused some people to be like this game is a little funky yeah um i i kind of had that as i was revisiting it because i was trying to make an aggro deck and i was like how do you even do that with that this is weird um but i do think a lot of players ended up enjoying that because there was a lot of instances that it was not so direct right i can jump from playing standard magic right now with aggro red and i know my mission i know my goal I probably don't mulligan and I just swing at the player until they're dead, right? Like there's little things that are going to change uh, my decision making, but um, it's pretty direct. But in Artifact, 
like I feel like there's quite a few things that are going to change uh, what I'm going to do. And I think a big part of that is actually the three boards um, in particular. But it does cause the game to be it doesn't feel as accessible even to existing card game players i feel like at times because i think even existing card game players they go into a card game expecting some of these kind of tried and true things and it's not a bad thing that artifact did this um and that you have to develop new heuristics but i do think it caused a lot of people to be like well what is this game right it sort of creates a new barrier to entry here where you're subverting player expectations a bit in terms of them being able to bring the knowledge with them. The same, Dark Souls does the same, the right. same thing, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, did we go a whole it's video Elden, about missing, it's, dark, it's, <laughs> missing Dark Souls? It's the Elden Ring of card games. Right, it's that um, you feel a little bit like a card game baby when you show up and play yeah. Artifact because you're like, wow, this doesn't quite work the way that I expect it to. Uh, and in the same way that that uh that dark souls requires of you it takes time to internalize those new systems before you get to the point where you can begin seeing into the mastery and i think that was very off-putting to a lot of card game players i think a lot of people ended up kind of feeling that weirdness but then also feeling the weirdness of the rng and just kind of assuming the rng was like that and i i do think the rng was problematic in how some of it was implemented but i think that um like I think the RNG worked as far as what it was trying to accomplish, and it did end up kind of creating the system that forced players to go along more with heuristics as opposed to going necessarily right. off of their deck piloting. So Artifact to me is a game about adaptability. There's a lot of uh, random variance that happens in the game where uh, you are put into a situation that is suboptimal for you, yeah. and your response to those Uh, those situations are what will lead you to victory in terms of, okay, well maybe I've invested now, now that the, the, the roles didn't go my way here, I need to focus elsewhere. And I have two other opportunities to pursue the, the, my strategies there. And maybe even the opportunity comes back up again in this other lane later, but right now I'm not winning that lane. Right. So I need to focus my, my efforts elsewhere. And this adaptability I think is something that makes players who want their uh memorization knowledge their their um uh they want that rewarded this is usually high skill players is they this is what they look for is that they're like i want my experience and knowledge of the game systems to matter magic does some similar things here in that it puts players in a situation where they have to respond to uh situations that they've been put in they don't ha- you don't have enough mana you you which Artifact doesn't have that problem. Let's Artifact that doesn't mind. have that problem. Yeah. Um, you, you've you deployed your troops. Uh, you, you've chosen which lane you want your hero to go in because that's the one you feel like you need some oomph to. Yeah. Uh, but it turns out it didn't end up in the right spot that you particularly wanted it to. You sort of have more combined power in that lane now, but it didn't break the right way. All right, well, I'm going to give up on that one. I'm going to move on. I think in terms of accessibility, that is something very hard to... To, to this, the game does not do a good job of teaching people that 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 is the skill, right? right? It looks like it's just a bunch of randomness, and that things just end up not going your way, and you're not really sure why, right? Like that's the surface level. Underneath that surface level, there is a lot of adaptability that needs to happen. I think it's funny because we we were talking before this that um, uh, you know Richard Garfield has uh, given tons of talks on luck versus skill, and not to you know go too much back to the uh, randomness talk but i do think that when we look at artifact artifact is a very very high skill game and a very very high uh luck game uh which is similar to poker yeah and it it's interesting because i think even poker is very difficult for people to see the skill behind poker um i think it, if you play it en- enough times you'll start to see it but i think from an outsider's perspective you're just like well you just like bluff like <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you just like look at people with right. a straight face yeah. like okay <laughs> cool well and I, I think that's what's so interesting here with artifact too is that you're sort of dealt hands to each lane and then you choose whether you want to invest further in one or make bets or if you want to fold and you're like i don't want to invest anymore in this hand i'm not going to win it yeah uh, so i'm going to uh, take my efforts elsewhere and by adapting and doing damage control in that way you'll ultimately lead yourself to victory 
right? The other part of it that's interesting too is like, okay, you can kill two towers or you can kill the same tower twice. But if you try to kill the same one twice, it it's, actually it's more way more. It's tw- it's, it's a third 40, of, 40 more damage. Okay, 40 more damage yeah. you need to do. Which is, I'm like, that's that, of course, like, of course it is, right? Right. <laughs> it's a game about adaptability. You yeah. can't just keep doing the same thing and expect to, to win. Right. Maybe there's a deck that can at some point. I think there whatever. are. Yeah, but, yeah. But what it's I mean also is, it, if you keep something unchecked, right? Like if you don't also right. adapt in a defensive way, then someone's just going to go and dogpile all yeah. their stuff and destroy. Well, and your I think that's main tower. right. That's one of the reasons why I think a traditional aggro strategy probably doesn't really work right. because you you have to sort of play offense and defense at the same time. It's also why, as far as I can tell, there's not a ton of cards. There's like one or two blue cards that deal direct damage to the tower. Um, in order to, because really like that was my next thought is, okay, if I can't have all these creatures on here, instead I'll play more like control burn basically where I'm like playing stuff to keep my enemy at, at bay, but then just taking out their tower damage periodically, um, with my other damage, but there's not enough cards in the base set that allow you to do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that another thing that comes up in terms of accessibility here is that, um, there are a bunch of unspoken rules, I guess, as to what, what I should call them, in that, like, okay, well, you can only cast spells if you have a hero in the lane of that color. Yeah. And apparently if that hero is stunned, you can't cast spells in that lane. Yeah, I found that out last night, Which, and it was infuriating. Right, that's just, like, this weird edge case thing that, yeah. like, isn't really, sp- like obvious or spoken or intuitive yeah. it, 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 i guess it's it's not even really that intuitive i don't know there's i don't there's, think it's intu- it's intuitive when you well it's not intuitive but then when you think about it yeah, and you think about right. how you're casting the things <laughs> the cards even say like choose a hero or it says like a, a target hero does this but if you can't target them because they're stunned then they can't cast a spell right but god does it feel terrible <laughs> oh it feels so awful yeah um yeah we should talk about viewership. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so so another aspect of the approachability here is that um, Artifact is not a particularly easy game to watch. Yeah. Um, Even after playing quite a few games, uh, right. it's still... I can watch a game and I'll be like, I don't know. I right. don't know what just happened. And when you think about the important information, right? Like, wh- wh- what are the, the basketball hoops in this scenario? It's the, <laughs> the life of the towers, right? So you need to be able to display, okay, here is how much life each of these towers have, maybe even the number of things that are deployed in those lanes for each each team or whatever. And that's something that like a tournament can do in terms of an overlay or whatever, mm-hmm. where you'd be able to see like, oh, okay, well, this is how these things are going. Yeah. Uh, it's a little weird that you would then sort of be watching a summary of the game rather right. than the game itself. But when you look at something like somebody streaming on Twitch, it's very hard to watch yeah. in terms of like understanding everything that's going on. And this was a huge hit for them, I think, when they first started the game and had it go into beta um, and people were streaming it, is I think that really it was the viewership that, was going to kind of make or break this game initially. And I think that it built quite a bit of hype and that they had 60,000 some odd players on like day one of it coming out, which was great, but it went down afterwards. And I think a big part of it was, I mean, a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about in these videos, but also viewership. I think the perception from players, I was there sitting watching all these streams. I had played the game. I was playing the game. But I was seeing a bunch of players and I was of the understanding as well that like I can't understand what's happening in these other people's games. It's also just that like where do you put your focus as a as an audience member? You know, right. like uh, if we look at sports, there's a ball and you're like, where's the ball? OK, that's what I'm looking at. Right? Yeah. We're here. It's like there's three lanes and there's I think maybe that's part of like we're looking at this lane. We're looking at this lane. We're looking at this and that what that's supposed to do. But yeah. It's still, it's, 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 I think they did their best to chunk the information that was in the game, but I still think even with that, it's still very complex. And I think, um, I watched, uh, I think we both watched, uh, Raynad's, um, uh, review of Artifact back in the day. Cause we, we made some deep cuts. All right. We went back, we watched a lot of videos and, uh, something Raynad said in his review of it, uh, I thought was funny was like the game just plays like it's a giant math equation, um, which Look, in all fairness, all card games are just giant math equations. But this is, to your point, I think, in the previous video on randomness, is when a game shows its hand too much, when it shows what's happening underneath a little bit too much, 
it it sort of it gives the player like too much to think about right like there's already a lot to think about when you're playing magic and there's like all these creatures on the board and you have to do a lot of math when you're seeing that math update in real time you're still kind of doing those equations in artifact like you see all the things in artifact and i'm seeing like okay well that's dealing two but it's aiming that direction but i'm aiming up towards that and i'm dealing three and like i'm still doing all of that math but now there's actually a second number (laughs) that i'm looking at because i'm seeing the damage that's gonna be done the health it has and whether it's going to die and the attack direction and the damage i'm dealing to the tower and the damage they're dealing to my tower and it's just so much to see up front yeah, one and the example that we sort of brought up earlier outside of this conversation was talking about the difference between like say giant growth in in magic which is something that gives plus 3 plus 3 to a creature versus a kill spell, right? Like a thing that just says destroy target creature. And the sim- the the simplicity in those uh difference in those two effects is like okay, well, I can now just remove something from combat. I don't need to do this combat math where if I'm giving something plus 3 plus 3, I'm now thinking about the actual math and numbers itself rather than just i can just um, uh uh, remove this from the equation completely yeah uh and artifact has tons of cards that are like plus three minus three deal a couple damage here do a couple or whatever this gets plus two retaliate and i'm right did you know that apparently if you have plus two retaliate it actually only deals two retaliate damage but it does not (laughs) deal any more direct damage and so, okay. but I don't, it, you can't track that. <laughs> and don't, don't forget armor. And there's then toughness it's got armor. armor and, right. uh, there's piercing yeah. damage. Um, Jeez. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Lots of math. Siege. There is siege. That's true. There's siege. Yep. I don't think there's an indicator to show, like there's not an indicator no. to show your retaliation damage, to show siege damage, to show how much piercing yeah. damage you deal. It's a lot. It's a lot. There's yeah. a lot of numbers going on. Yeah. Um, it's something that I try to do in my game design a lot too. Is put like, a lot of numbers in. No, eliminate as much player math as possible. <laughs> yeah. In terms of like, how do I pull this back to a systems behind the scenes level and let players just experience, you know, the the feelings yeah. rather than having to do a bunch of combat math. Well, and I think what ends up happening, and I'm kind of wondering if this was intentional, is that it gets to a point where like the board state gets too complex for you to really hold it all in your head at once. And yeah. you start sort of playing on vibes, right? You, you end up in this like, <laughs> you know, you end up in this like intuition land where you're like, yeah. okay, I think I'm okay here. Yeah. Uh, okay. I can see which things are going to die based on, you know, the X's on them or whatever. But like, I, I don't, I, I really just have a feeling of whether or not I'm doing well. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to try to to save the things that are going to die, and I'm going to try to kill more of my opponent's things. But, like, I just kind of count the Xs and then see how much damage I'm doing their tower, and then I move on because it's just too much. Yeah. And this, honestly, I think that's intentional. It's something that Richard Garfield has talked about before in that when, you know, possibility space gets too too broad, you have to act on heuristics. Yeah. I think, um, obviously, we've seen that there are diehard fans uh, of Artifact. Um we still enjoy many parts of artifact. Um, I can't speak for you, but I'm assuming. Oh yeah. 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 No, I think um, artifacts actually, I think artifact is a very good game. Yeah. Um, I think it, it doesn't get, uh, I, I really do think that it's, this is definitely one of its biggest flaws is that the best parts of the game are obfuscated behind all of this possibility space and noise. Right. Yeah. And it's a tough balance because I think that, uh, one thing I think was was uh, a real I don't know how to, uh, a real bummer you know for <laughs> Artifact. Uh, everyone the minute that it was announced, everyone kept comparing it to Hearthstone. Yeah, and so when it came out, everyone was like, "This is way complicated. This isn't like Hearthstone. Why would they make this?" And I, it's like it's, a lot of people didn't get like maybe it's not for Hearthstone players, right? Like. Right. And I think it's okay. I think it's great to have a game that comes out that sees Hearthstone as like, yeah, that's cool. You guys can have that. We're going to make another game that's for like a different type of player. And I think that's good. And I don't ever want to take that away. I think that the, like you can have you can have your Diablos and your Path of Exiles, right? Like, and I think that it's good to have those different options for players. 